Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, the terminology is up for debate and some people have uh, strong opinions on it. <laughs> um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, we do the record the shows every week, so if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. Um, you can always go to our website afterwards and see our recordings. They are all posted um, publicly onto our YouTube account. Um, any presentations people may include, uh, handouts, documents, we post them as well. Um, and any websites that might be mentioned, we collect them into our delicious account for um, saving websites, saving links, and that will be available to you as well. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so um, please do share with any of your uh, colleagues, friends, neighbors, family, anybody who might be you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, they are welcome to watch, um, join us on Wednesdays, or watch any of the recordings we have posted out there. And I'll show you where all those recordings are um, at the end of today's show. I'll show you our website and where you can access all of that. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini print training sessions, demos of services and products. Uh, really our only criteria is that anything we do is library related. Either something libraries are doing, uh, programs they're doing, events they're hosting, software pro um, resources they're using, or anything we think might be of use to libraries. Uh, some of our sessions are uh, Nebraska-centric, things that we're doing here at the Library Commission, of course, um, but we are a national show, so we have um, all sorts of topics that are from anywhere um, and be of use for any libraries, not just Nebraskans. Uh, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations, but we also bring in guest speakers, as we have this morning. Um, on the line with us and on the camera, as you can see, is uh, hi, <laughs> Elizabeth Rivera. Um, she is from the Los Alamos County Libraries in New Mexico. Good morning. Good morning, Eliza. Good morning. Hi there. Um, and she's got a session for us um, about um, doing ESL uh, programming, uh, conversation circles. It's a really very interesting uh, idea that they came up with there, which I think is really fun and creative. So um, she's going to tell us all about their conversation circles at the library that they're doing. So I'll just hand it over to you to uh, take it away. Thank you, Krista. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So just to get started, I, I had a picture of me in case the webcam didn't work. This <laughs> is me, uh, where I'm uh, wearing my book earrings, wearing my book skirt, reading oh. Sandman to a robot, a skeleton, and a unicorn. Perfect. And that can Sounds tell you good. a lot. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a librarian to me. <laughs> yeah. um, so I am originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico. That's where I was born, and it's also where I went to school, where I went to library school at the University of Puerto Rico. And uh, in my library career, my first library job was uh, as a shelver, a page, in uh, Snow Isle Library System in Washington State. And it's their fault I'm a librarian because somebody left one of those ALA publications in the break room. And I don't know, around 2000, 2001, there was this terrible fear that there were not enough librarians in the pipeline, that all the baby boomers were going to retire, and there was no way to fill those jobs. <laughs> mm -hmm. The huge retirement was going to come, yes. I know. I think anybody mm -hmm. who was thinking about libraries or involved in libraries, they'll remember that. So I read that in the break room, and well, that the rest is history. Um, I've worked also as a school librarian, aside from a public librarian, uh, back home in Puerto Rico at a private school. That was a K-12 school. And uh, in public libraries, I've also worked in Coos County, Oregon at the Coquille Public Library most recently, and now in the Los Alamos Public Library here in New Mexico where I'm the reference librarian. <laughs> that gives you a little bit of my background. So just to really dive in, what is the deal with conversation circles? Where did this come from? 
for us, it came from a patron. It was her request. It was a Japanese mother who always brought her baby to all our programs. And she really wanted to practice English because she wasn't going to be in the United States for that long. This is very common for our community. If you're familiar with Los Alamos at all, you know that this was a community that was founded essentially to build an atomic bomb. This is why they still call it the secret city in some, in some cases, because it was not known that there was a community here, or they were at least trying to conceal it. They didn't conceal it that well. And to this day, the Los Alamos National Laboratory is here and is the main engine of employment for this tiny community, but it makes it extremely international. People come from all over the world to work here, and they may be here for three months, they may be here for three years, it's unclear how long they're going to be here. So we just have this very dynamic and diverse community in a very sort of oddball place up in a little mountain town in New Mexico where you would expect people to the second most common language to be Spanish it isn't it's actually Chinese it's Mandarin so looking at that language uh, other than English spoken at home I checked out the census the national number at least in 2013 was about 21 percent New Mexico it's about 36 percent and I checked out Nebraska before we started here, and it looks like you guys are about 10.3. But I'm sure those of you familiar with various communities in Nebraska, that that can vary widely between one community and another. Uh, for example, here in Los Alamos, our, um, our percentage of language other than English spoken at home is higher than the national, but lower than the New Mexico. It's a little somewhere in between there. And, and it just really depends on, on the demographics of your community, who's there, what has been happening, who's employing, what kind of immigration there has been, and historically what immigration there has been. Um, if there was a, a particular community there and their family came and their neighbors came and that's continued through the years, that makes a, a big difference in, in who is going to live there and how many generations they've been there and what language is spoken. So why did we do this? Obviously, we had a patron request, and we take those pretty seriously. But it also covers these three bases. And these are things that are probably on everybody's plans, on all your strategic planning, serving the underserved, supporting lifelong learning, building community. I'm sure you're all familiar with those phrases just from, like I said, your strategic planning. Frequently. Uh, patrons who speak languages other than English can be underserved in a lot of libraries. They probably aren't in, say, Queens, which uh, has put so much effort into uh, approaching their different language communities because they are the most diverse place in the world. But for most of us, maybe we're just not prepared to really address the needs of these uh, different linguistic communities. Supporting lifelong learning, of course, that, that's at the heart of what all of us are doing, and uh, we're doing it across the board. We want to, to provide those opportunities. And building community was particularly important to us because of the demographics of who was going to attend these, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. The planning. So this is how it started. Uh, there was a bunch of research, and I went crazy with the research. Um, typical librarian, I'm sure it would have happened to you. Don't do like I did. I wound up reading Paulo Freire and, uh, you know, Pedagogy of the Oppressed <laughs> and going really deep into ESL theory, but that's not really what was needed for this. The questions that we answered that were really the important ones at the end of the day or what is already available in the community? And that helped us answer a couple of different questions, like what is being addressed and what is not being addressed? Who is being served and who is not being served already in the community? How do we not duplicate efforts in the community but work together? Um, how are other places doing this? And there I did a lot of research. Um, Canada in particular, uh, in Canadian libraries and community centers, there's wonderful research going on. 
and uh, in, in universities. There's a lot of work going on with conversation circles. I particularly wound up patterning this after the Ann Arbor program in Michigan. And what is our primary audience? Thinking about who we were going to serve really paid off at the end of the day. It, it turned out to be key to the success of the program. So the first part of the study was where, what's already available. In our community, what we found were two major programs. One were free SL classes at UNMLA. Uh, that's our local branch of, of the state university system. And yes, they were free, but they were traditional classes offered, um, you know, at standard times. Although there was a night class as well, but it was a very traditional classroom experience. So we knew we weren't going to duplicate that. None of us are ready to start teaching ESL. And the other program was the Rio Arriba Adult Literacy Program. And Rio Arriba technically is the neighboring county, but they uh, also include us in their service. And there are also volunteers who go to Rio Arriba to work with them. And they mostly do one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is key. They were working with individuals, not with groups. So that started to show us where, where the focus was in the community and what, what was already happening. So how are other places doing this? From looking at other libraries, universities, all kinds of institutions that were running programs like this, calling them Conversation Cafe, Conversation Circle, um, ESL Circle, uh, Conversation Tree I saw in one place. I saw that most places were using volunteers. The emphasis was on a relaxed atmosphere. This is really key, and you're probably going to hear me say it 20 times before we're done. The relaxed atmosphere is key. And there's little to no focus on grammar or other technicalities. It's just communication. The focus is being able to communicate, to get your message across. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining grammar. So what would be the program cost? That was something that we were concerned about. What, what was the real investment? We knew that we could commit to doing 45 minute to one hour sessions once a week. So that was a, a, a time investment that we were willing to make. The prep time varies between five and 20 minutes for each session. And we wanted to use volunteers, but of course we weren't really ready when we started. So we used staff, mostly myself, and I trained volunteers to take over for me as we went along. And the volunteers in our case came from an existing volunteer pool. Here in Los Alamos, we have a situation that's actually similar to the one I encountered in Coquille in Oregon, that we had a lot of people who wanted to volunteer in the library, but uh, they don't want to shelf read. What you need is shelf reading, let's be honest, right? But that's not what they want. They want to feel like they're really making a contribution and to be engaged. They, you kind of need to entertain your volunteers as well. And we didn't have jobs for them. And, and this is a common situation for us. My uh, volunteer coordinator will come to me and say, hey, I have this person or these three people that just showed up. Do you have anything for them to do? And frequently we don't. But this time I said, hey, look in the volunteer pool, see if we can come up with some people who might find this interesting. And we got lucky. People found this very interesting. They, they, they really felt like they were contributing to the community. So we had a lot of engagement. How to train the volunteers. So there were two keys to this. Um, we asked the volunteers to come and observe and participate for one or two sessions or more if they felt uh, maybe a little hesitant. Sometimes people were really concerned that they were going to have to be English teachers. And that's really not the key here. Uh, so have them visit so that they really see what it's like. And I provided them with a volunteer handbook. My volunteer handbook is uh, patterned very closely on the one from Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
And Crystal will be posting a copy. I'll be sending her a copy. If you want a copy of the Ann Arbor, Michigan one, I have permission from them to email it out to anyone who requests it, but I don't have permission to publish it. So I'll be giving you my email, and if you want to see the, the original that I patterned my volunteer handbook. Mine is much shorter. It's very streamlined. Theirs is much fatter. I can yeah, we can post that yep, along with the recording afterwards. You guys all have access to it. Not a problem. Yeah, and like I said, Crystal will be Here's posting a copy. I, I like the streamlined one because it's a lot less overwhelming for the volunteer. Mm -hmm. If I give them something that has seven pages as opposed to something that has 40 pages. <laughs> so I really wanted to keep this very informal, very relaxed. That is just the real key for this. So the training manual highlights, just so you kind of get an idea of what's in there. Keep it casual, keep it friendly, keep it light. You, what you really want is for people to feel comfortable speaking a language that is not their own. So the atmosphere is key. Encourage equal participation. So you as a facilitator, rather than teaching English, what you're trying to do is provide everybody with an opportunity to talk and to kind of keep an eye out for who's not talking and how can I draw them out and bring them into the conversation. And the, the manual has a few tips and tricks for that. Have backup topics and ideas. I can't tell you how many times I thought, ooh, this is going to be a hot topic. People are going to love to talk about this. It's going to be so great. And I got crickets. Nobody was interested in this subject, so you have to have a little bit of flexibility. And again, the manual also lists places where you can get ideas, where you can think about what are good topics to talk about, what are questions I can ask. Make sure they understand you and understand each other. And this is an important part of just watching everybody, making sure that communication is being achieved and it's not just somebody talking and everybody else tuning them out because they don't understand restating things, rephrasing things in, in, in other modes of expression, changing your words to make sure that everybody is on the same page and that there's an, a real conversation going on. And to remember that intercultural communication isn't just language. Um, obviously aside from verbal language there's body language, but there are cultural expectations, there are things we take for granted, values we take for granted, and being aware that those things can come up is going to be key because it will help you negotiate any situations that come up, anything uncomfortable that may come up, and explain things. Also, it's a great source of conversation material. When we look at what I thought the weight of what I was saying was, versus what you understood or what how that reads to you and that's really important and again in the manual I go into that a little bit deeper so the other question we had what is our target audience for us what we figured out our primary audience was the caretaker to a small child or infant they may have older kids but they're definitely home with a child a small child this made it extremely difficult to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring or to do the class environment because you can't really bring your baby to the classroom. Although our instructors here at UNMLA are pretty flexible, but it really doesn't work out so well. These people may be in the United States only briefly. Sometimes they're not sure how long they're going to be here. Contracts uh, change as they go along. They're going to come with varying degrees of language proficiency. Uh, some people show up and they are absolutely fluent. Some people are really struggling. All they've had is an introductory course before they've got here. So you're going to have a lot of different levels. And what we came to understand about this group is, yes, they are definitely interested in the language. They're definitely interested in developing their language skills. but they also were seeking social connection, um, especially for someone who's the primary caretaker of a small child. It can be extremely isolating to move to a new community, much less to a new community where you, the language is not where you're comfortable. 
you're home all day with this small child. Maybe the only time you get out is baby time, which was something we used to our advantage. But they were looking to meet people, to get to know other people, to get to know the community. And this was something that really worked in our favor and that really helped build the program. So planning and marketing then, we, we thought about who this audience was. So we cross-promoted with the other ESL programs, even though we thought there wasn't going to be a lot of overlap between us but because of the network. People who knew other people in their, in their native language communities, other family members who maybe couldn't make it to these classes, and with youth services. Our youth service program uh, promoted us by, you know, verbally and by using handouts during their programs where we had that target audience already there. Those uh, primary caretakers were there at baby time, they were there at story time, and you could speak to them quite directly. We also use the baby time room because as baby time is organized in such a way that they've formed a circle of chairs around a play area, so we've got a corral <laughs> to sort of trap the children in there. And we already knew that we wanted to welcome those kids, so we needed to think about a space that was going to work for that. And Youth Services said, yeah, sure, absolutely, use our space. So we set it up right after baby time when the baby corral was set up and the kids were already there. We planned our sessions around the school calendar because there were a lot of people who did have older kids and once school was out they were not going to be able to come. And our flyers and handouts clearly welcomed kids. We made it, we tried to make it very clear that kids were welcome so that people would feel like they really could do this. So this is what our flyers and handouts looked like. And you can see sort of what I emphasized. Free, very important. People did ask us how much it was going to cost, so we, we edited the flyers. No registration. We got a lot of calls of how do I sign up. It's drop in exclusively. Make whatever sessions you're interested in. You can just come. And kids are welcome. So those three elements were key to, to who we wanted to attract. And you know, we talked a little bit about the advantages on, on the back of the handout, you know, practice and improve your, your English, but also meet new people and learn more about our community. And those really were key elements. Um, conversation circles for us wound up being about more than just English. It wound up about really getting connected into Los Alamos and making friends. What worked? Yes, there were things that work. So we're gonna, I'm going to start with the good stuff. What went right? Having this clearly defined target audience was critical. Uh, knowing that helped us choose the right time and place, helped us target the marketing correctly, and helped us out with word of mouth because the mommy network got activated. So that really worked for us. Riddles and logic puzzles. This was awesome. <laughs> uh, even with people with very limited no uh, knowledge of English, but who could still string sentences together, getting the riddles really, really worked. So let's try this one. Let's see how, um, if anybody knows the answer to this one. Acting on an anonymous okay. phone call, the police raid a house to arrest the suspect. They don't know what he looks like, but they know his name is John and that he is inside the house. The police bust in on a carpenter, a truck driver, a mechanic, and a fireman playing cards. Without hesitation or communication of any kind, they immediately arrest the fireman. How did they know which person to arrest? <sighs> Anybody willing to take a uh, Anybody out there have any idea? Type in the questions and let us know. Believe it or not, oh, this God. one was solved by my the person in my group who had the lowest level of English, the person who struggled <laughs> the most, figured it out. Well, once you, you know, like, what's going on, it's, yeah, it's just... So...
No guesses? No, nobody typed anything. Nobody has any okay. idea, any clues, I guess. So what <laughs> my, what, what uh, the person asked me, she looked at me and she said, John, John is a man's name, right? And I said, yes, in English, John is usually a man's name. And she said, were the other players women? Mm. That's what someone just typed in finally, yeah. <laughs> the others were women. The others were women. And uh, <laughs> that actually was also a springboard to talk about gender expectations. Mm -hmm. Because what usually catch, trips people up on this puzzle is the carpenter, truck driver, mechanic, fireman playing cards. The expectation that those are male-dominated professions. Mm-hmm. So we took it from there and we talked a little bit. So from that riddle, one, we had the sort of the fun of we're doing riddles. And we also had a chance to talk about cultural expectations. And, and we, we sort of went on a little tangent there talking about are there jobs where you really expect to find only men or only women. It was, it was really uh, a very engaging session. The game of and scruples. And that's the kind of thing is an example of how this works, that it isn't, you know, a standard um, curriculum. It's just we're going to chat about this thing and other topics, and then you'll learn Absolutely. the language at the same time. It's like a side effect. <laughs> Absolutely. So the game of scruples um, is, is a game that you've probably played. This was actually a board game in the 80s. And uh, it presents dilemmas like this. At a restaurant you own, you see a cook drop a lamb chop on the floor. Pick it up, wash it, reheat it, and serve it on a plate. Do you reprimand the cook? And these are great because people really will come up with different answers and feel like they have the correct, good answer for this and can't understand why you would think differently. For the record, if you uh, ever go to a restaurant owned by people in my conversation circles group, yeah, that lamp chop is getting washed. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, team lamp chops are expensive was definitely in the in the majority. <laughs> uh, well, I suppose that's something to think about, but there are also health codes. <laughs> the, that the argument was yeah. presented, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it those kinds of moral dilemmas, and you can one mm -hmm. thing you can do to get these, you can actually Google scruples dilemmas mm. but you can also if you find in in a thrift shop you can find a copy of the game of scruples and just have the little cards oh, probably yeah mm -hmm. that come with the the board game and that's great and again this really leads to meaty discussions oh sorry pun not intended <laughs> uh, uh, it really uh, leads to those moments where people say well why would you even think that why how can you and it really lets people express themselves. It was really fun. Would you rather, also great, you can also get mm -hmm. this in board game form or Google uh, lists of this. Would you rather be extremely hairy or completely hairless? Mm -hmm. Work hard at an interesting job or relax at a boring job? Be the best dancer in the world or the best singer in the world? And why? That's key. You can't just let them answer, I'd rather this than that. They have to explain and justify their answer. And what I did with this one was I printed out a bunch of these on scraps of paper, cut them out, and put them in like a pretzel jar. And I'd pass the jar around, let people reach in, pull one out, read it, make sure everybody understood it had all the vocabulary and, and of course some of these are incredibly silly would you rather be extremely hairy or completely hairless so once the laughter dies down you'd have to go through that explanation why would you choose one over the other this was super fun so we've done this multiple times because it's just so funny um, and I did find out that at least for the Japanese mothers, they really feel strongly about being the best singer rather than the best dancer because of karaoke culture. So that also was a springboard, you know, tell me uh -huh. about karaoke, okay, why is it important? And it gives you, it, it just gives you a lot of openings to 
have fun and still get people talking. And that's the key, get people talking. Taboo. Um, this was also a board game in the 80s, so you can probably get cards. And you can also Google puzzles like this. So you work with partners. And you have a secret word that you want your partner to say. And you want to get them to say that, but you can't say any of the forbidden words. So to try and get somebody to say panda without saying China, bear, black and white, bamboo, or zoo is pretty tricky. And at first I was worried that this was going to be too hard, that it was just that I was really going to stump people. But they really got into the spirit of the game and came up with really creative solutions to try and get their partners to say the code word. Um, and I think part of that is actually because they're used to not having the right word and having to find ways around it. So they're always trying to find a way to express themselves and maybe they don't know the exact right word they want to use because they don't know that word in English. So they're always looking for these circuitous ways of communicating. Um, so this went over really well. And again, you can probably get one of these for a buck at a garage sale and it leads to a lot of fun and a lot of laughter. This is something that I actually discovered the second year. The New York Times has a whole educational section. I was not familiar with it, but I was going through it looking for ideas. Uh, and they have a whole student section and it's, it's not behind the paywall or anything. You can just access it. It's really great. And they have an entire section called what's going on with this picture. And they have pictures like this completely stripped of context. So now I'm going to ask you, what's going on in this picture? Some crazy Photoshop? <laughs> no, nope, no, nope, the picture is totally legit. These are all pictures that ran with news stories. Really? Okay. Yes. So then you start looking for clues. What kind of country do you think this is happening in? Oh, I kind of assumed it was New York, but I guess not, huh? Might not be New York. Be, yeah. Looking at the uniform there, it doesn't look like something I'd expect to see in New York. Yeah, and I wish I could see the license plate a little clearer on that truck. Yeah, yeah that would give a clue. <laughs> it's warm, though. It's like South America somewhere or Mexico. It's actually Actually. happening in Venezuela. Venezuela, okay, yep. Yep. It's in Venezuela. And so I, you can bring a few of these from this session in and start to talk about, well, can you see the license plate? Can you read the sign? Can you read the graffiti? What are people wearing? Mm. Do these buildings look familiar? What is this guy doing in the water? So this is happening in Venezuela, and this guy was a citizen who was trying to fix a broken water pipe. I uh, say so probably because the, the uh, officer there do not seem in very much concerned. <laughs> um, just, oh, yep, he's down there working on it. <laughs> so uh, the reporter, the photojournalist really, saw this while he was driving around and he was trying to get pictures of everyday life in Caracas. Mm -hmm. And he saw this. I thought, this is awesome. I got to get a picture of this. <laughs> and so many of the pictures are like this. When, when you first see them, they seem ridiculous. What is happening in this photograph? Or, so having that whole explanation, well, why do you think it's this country? Or why do you think this about this picture, again, gives you some material to kind of pull threads and, and have a conversation about it. Uh, and it's amazing what you can do with a picture that's entirely out of context. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What is this? And they have uh, archives and archives of these. So that's really great. I've, I've placed the link there and, and you'll be able to access it when the slides are up. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Other topics that worked. Food. You'd be amazed how often we wind up talking about food. <laughs> Always food. What food do you miss from home? What food can you not get here? What food is it hard to make? Um, what foods do you like from 
from New Mexico that you've tried or what's been your experience with New Mexican food. So food is always a successful topic. You can always bring the conversation around to food no matter how often you've already done it. Places to visit in the area, also very popular conversation topic. Most of these people were newcomers, at least in our situation. So they really wanted to know. And even someone who, who had only been here maybe one or two months more than somebody who just arrived would say, oh, the place I really like to visit when I got here was this. And there would be great conversations and places to take the kids. Where are the good playgrounds? <laughs> what are good places to take the kids? So those were also very popular. And again, it's the topic you can revisit. Healthcare turned into a surprisingly active conversation. Both the, the comparison with how is healthcare where, where I last lived to here. And also, how do I get health care, and who's a good pediatrician, and who's the good uh, OBGYN? And what is your experience with your new doctor here? How do I find a doctor? And vocabulary. This was one where we did a lot of vocabulary building. People would say, well, I, I need to ask questions of my doctor. So I, I would print out some lists of uh, vocabulary words for health. Uh, again, I just Googled these. To, to, to give them some tools to talk to their healthcare providers. This was very, uh, people really enjoyed that. And what do you love about your country of origin? Um, I didn't know if people were going to get into that, but yes, people love to talk about what their country of origin is like, or if they're people who've moved around a lot, which we have that too, then they will tell you what they liked about all the different places they've lived. So it would really develop, or where they've traveled. So that's really, those were really good topics that, that just really, you can visit again and again, depending on your group, I guess. Another thing, we just lucked out with our volunteers. We were lucky. Uh, I can't say enough about how great the volunteers we had. What do you need in a, in a volunteer is they need to be, they need to have native language fluency in English. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be native speakers of English. I, my first language is Spanish, for example, but I do have native language fluency. So we had several uh, volunteers who actually came from other speaking backgrounds. One was from the Philippines, one was from India, but they had native speaker fluency in English. But they also had that great perspective that experience in intercultural communication, that experience of being in a new country, uh, which gave them just a lot of empathy. And that, that's the key. Even if you can't find someone who has ever spoken another language or who's traveled a lot, empathy and humor. But just someone who's there willing to be open, willing to make mistakes, and willing to hold people's hands as they build their confidence, which is really what you're getting at with the language skills here. It's really building confidence. Uh, that's the key to the good volunteer. The other volunteer we had, she was a native speaker of English, but she had studied Russian and she had lived in Moscow and worked as an interpreter. So again, she knew what it was like. She knew what it was like to have to learn a language, go to a different country, and, and, and live a different life for some amount of time. Uh, and we just got really lucky that our community had those people, that, uh, that they were here and they, were, they wanted to help, and they just brought that amazing, uh, those amazing compassionate hearts and, and life experiences that really helped them out. This they also brought fantastic apple pie and apple butter. <laughs> Very important. Food again, food is always a great equalizer. <laughs> Absolutely. And the apple pie was a direct result of a request from a, a couple we had from China. And they were here and they really wanted to try American things like they'd seen in the movies. And that will come up again in a minute. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, have you had apple pie? No. And she had apple trees and she baked pies. So the next session she showed up with 
a jar of apple butter, and this beautiful apple pie. And let me tell you, nothing goes over better than sharing food. <laughs> it always goes over. There were some things that didn't go so well. So let's talk a little bit about what could have gone better. Working with absolute beginners. Conversation circles can work across many levels, but you can't work with someone who can't string together a sentence yet. They have to have a basic vocabulary. So you can't substitute formal learning. You can't work with somebody who's starting from zero. This was tricky for us because in my experience, I, I, I have taught English as a second language when I lived back in Puerto Rico. My mother is uh, an ESL professional. She was a professor of English in Puerto Rico for many, many years. And people underestimate their level of fluency. You will meet people who you would consider completely fluent, and they open the conversation with, I'm so sorry, my English is terrible. And I saw that in my students in Puerto Rico all the time. People who were perfectly competent in English, but their feelings of self-efficacy, of, of their confidence in the language was low, despite the fact that their skills were high. It's so, a comfort level that they're lacking. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually what you're working with. So I really worked hard on trying to, to talk to staff, to anybody who might be at the front desk and might get a question about this, and to put it on the on the flyers. All levels welcome. Because I wanted people who who could benefit from it to show up, to feel like they could show up. We did get one or two beginners that were just not far enough along. They really didn't have even basic vocabulary to do, for example, greetings and introduction. You need to be past that stage. You need to be able to say, hello, I am so and so and I am from here or there and this is, you know, these are my interests. They need to be able to, to get there. I haven't found a way to, to sort of level that out because when people measure their own levels of fluency, they're wrong. <laughs> They're just wrong. They're better than they think they are, and I don't want to do anything to discourage them. But every once in a while, you'll bump into someone who really, they're going to be completely lost, and how do you, how can you address that need? I don't know. So that was one part where we, we haven't figured it out, we haven't worked it out. The group was too big or too small. Conversation circles has a sweet spot. <laughs> One morning after baby time, we had 14 people plus the babies. That was chaos. If that had gone on yeah. for more sessions, I would have had to break it up. Two sessions of seven people, that would have been fine. 14 people with 14 babies. Wow. I mean, it was fun, but I wouldn't say it was effective. <laughs> we had a good time. We spent most of the time actually chasing the babies, um, but it was just too big. It, you really lose the intimacy. You lose the thread. It was hard to keep everybody on the same page. If you get this many people, break it up. Um, you really want to be in, 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 in a sort of smaller group, but the group needs to be big enough. We tried evening sessions because we got a request from one of our day sessions after baby time and she said, my husband would like to come, but he's at work all day. Can you do evening sessions? And we got two husbands and that was it. We were getting one or two participants for the night sessions, which is why we wound up cutting those out entirely. We did them for maybe half the year and then we cut them out because one person was just not enough to really keep it going. So there, there is kind of a sweet spot, and that's, that's key. Two Truths and a Lie did not work. Has anybody ever played Two Truths and a Lie? Um, All right. <laughs> I haven't played. I've seen it done, but I, have, I don't, we haven't done it. I haven't done it ourselves. I haven't done it myself, yeah. So I could not communicate how this worked, and it never really <laughs> gelled for our group. Um, I'm going to tell you three things about myself. 
Two of them are true. One of them is a lie. Right. So let's see if you can catch me. You can ask me questions to see if you can catch me in which one is the lie. One, I used to do synchronized swimming. Two, I was once an extra in a zombie movie. Three, I once lived in Florida. Uh, Give you three questions and see if you can catch me in which is the lie. Oh, geez. Where in Florida? Miami Springs. Miami Springs. I have relatives in Florida. Not there. Not near Miami, though. <laughs> what zombie movie? Barricade. It only made the festival circuit. <laughs> <laughs> so an independent zombie movie. <laughs> oh, very independent. I think my cousin financed that on his credit cards, he and his buddies. <laughs> what was the first one? Synchronized swimming? Synchronized swimming. I'd say this... Oh, somebody has a question. Synchronized duet or a team? Um, neither one. It was like an introductory class for little girls. So we were just learning basic skills. I never competed. Oh, okay. uh, all right, because then someone wanted to know what song did you swim to? Was there songs at that stage? No, I never got past Scalling and Tub. <laughs> <laughs> I was very basic. Uh, yeah. So All right, let's go with the living in Florida. We've got a couple of people are saying that living in Florida is the lie. Living in Florida is true. Ah. And believe it or not, synchronized swimming is true. The movie is false. I ah. do have a cousin who is a filmmaker who made an independent zombie movie called Barricade. Uh huh. But I didn't show up that night they were filming. It was a school night. Ah. <laughs> and he said, show up at the... At, at the parking garage at 3 a.m. We'll dress you up as a zombie with all my buddies. No, you didn't. At 3 a.m., yeah. <laughs> at 3 a.m., no. I've got school tomorrow. That's not happening. But it is a true film. <laughs> that, you just kind of it. <laughs> there. But, yeah, that did not work. I could not yeah. communicate the way to play this effectively, and it didn't go over well at all. So our results, how did we do? Uh, these are all the countries that were represented, uh, that have been represented in the past two years we've been doing the program. I guess it's not quite two years yet, uh, a year and a half maybe, that we've been doing the program. And as you can see, we've got a good spread. We've got nobody from the African uh, continent or from Oceania yet, but I'm hoping. Um, I, I hold out hope. Uh, and it's really cool that in this little mountain town, we've been able to get such a great spread. Um, then for fiscal year 1516 or school year 1516, we had 39 sessions and 165 total attendance. When we started sessions again in September, um, we had a core group of, 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 you know, of students from before who came back. And they are really devoted to the program, and they're they're the the faces that you can expect to see at every session, which is great. The fact that they they felt so committed to it. This year so far, <laughs> we've only had 26 sessions. We're not done with the year yet, but we also aren't doing the night sessions anymore. So we've had 96 total attendance for our adult programs. This is actually very good. Um, we have difficulty getting adults into our programs. Um, and I guess that's something that a lot of libraries struggle with. But this, we're actually pretty happy with this at this time. Here's some feedback that we got. And, and these are, I know these, these are our three hardcore moms who always come and who've become friends and they hang out together and their kids play together and they cook together. And when one of them gets strep throat, all the kids get strep throat. So the next session is going to be empty <laughs> because Lucas got strep throat. So Elizabeth got it. So then Sophie got it. And next thing you know, you can't make <laughs> because everybody's off sick. It's a social time for us, but it's also a social time for the kids. They can make friends and play. It helped me to know that there are more people like me and that I don't need to feel embarrassed. 
and this is a safe place where we can express our opinions. And this really covers the gamut of what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to achieve social connection. We wanted to let them feel comfortable in the language and to feel that they're safe and that they can really develop their skills. And it worked. That was what we wanted to achieve, and it worked. Then this <laughs> is actually my house. And in the front, you'll see these Chinese couple. And they were the ones who wanted to try out all the American things. And I said, well, if you're in New Mexico, you need to have a green chili cheeseburger. And they said, can we do that at a barbecue? And I said, yeah, of course. And they said, we've never been to a barbecue. We want to go to a barbecue like the movies. So I bought my husband a grill that he'd been wanting. <laughs> <laughs> And we, had, we gave them a barbecue, and this is a, a part, not the whole thing, but part of our, our sort of strong circle of volunteers and participants in conversation circles at my house at the barbecue where everybody had green chili cheeseburgers. Green chili cheeseburgers were had Sounds by all, good. and everybody brought something. It was great. Very all-American. <laughs> Absolutely. <Definitely. laughs> so it was really fun. That's so awesome to hear that they're wanting to like, experience all of I mean, it's just it's beyond just the learning the language. They want to experience this new country that they're in. And I assume these you said some of some of the participants aren't they don't know how long they're gonna be in the country or whatnot. I assume these guys were more like permanent. These residents. guys were here for three months, I think it was. Ah, the okay. couple in the front. Mm -hmm. The couple in the back with the little girls, they're actually They've moved to the States permanently. They've got their residency. Um, they're from Honduras. Mm -hmm. And then the couple, the sort of older couple, kind of towards the middle, were volunteers. Um, so they live here. They've lived here for many years. And then that's me over at the edge. I unfortunately cropped out my husband because he was trying to catch the dog. So <laughs> emotion in that picture. But uh, this was really... To me, this is really key, that it was, yes, it was language, yes, it was culture, but it was also community building. It was connection. Mm -hmm. Right. And we made those connections, and it really paid off. So thank you. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Okay. Yes, if anybody has any questions, uh, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, and there is... Uh, Liza's email address that you can use to contact her later as well and ask for that if they want that full um, absolutely handbook that you had the really longer one yeah. <laughs> um, we'll have the shorter one that we'll post um, afterwards with the show notes and everything um, but you contact her to get that one I did. I, I did. I was wondering. I don't. I don't remember if you mentioned what is your population served of your town. How many people are actually I in the community? I think we're at 17,000. Okay, so you're pretty small. You're one on, yeah. That's so funny. I feel like we're so big. <laughs> well, but. it depends on your point of view. Um, I'll let those of you online know. Um, this was when we have um, here at the Library Commission, we do our annual Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference that we did last month. And... Um, <laughs> this year we had a overabundance of, of submissions for a one-day event. Um, I had too many that I couldn't even fit them all into the day, and so many of our Encompass Live shows during the week, um, the last this month and next month, and maybe even beyond, are um, presentations that didn't fit into the day. And this is one of them. She had uh, submitted this to our Big Talk from Small Libraries, where we have our um, the max uh, either population served, or if you're at a school or university, FTE is 10,000. Um, which to some places is like it depends on your yeah where you're where you're coming from. For some people, that's too big for small, even. Um, yeah. In other areas, they're like, what? There are libraries that small? You know, some um, large companies consider small libraries having FTE or population served of twenty five thousand or less. Here in rural America, in Nebraska and New Mexico and elsewhere, that's not no. <laughs> Uh, you need to be a lot smaller than that to be small. So, 
on the smaller but if, side. If anybody is from a small library and they haven't done Big Talk for small libraries, mm -hmm. I cannot recommend it highly enough. I've been Thank attending you. for the past four years. It's great because mm -hmm. it's free and online, and yes. there's always something you can use. Always. Mm -hmm. And it's always recorded too, so just like you know, if you couldn't make it the day of, which we also had that case for some of our um, presenters that we had to adjust around and work with, um, is the recordings are up on the website now for anybody who wants to um, watch them. So nobody has any questions. Nobody's typed anything in. Okay, um, that's fine. Uh, this is great. I think it's a really. Um, I had not heard of the conversation circles as a way of doing SL. I've heard of the regular classes you go to, specific sessions, you know, more curriculum-based things. Um, I think this is a lot more fun and uh, more useful. I mean, I, I took language classes when I was in school, um, in, in um, um, high school, and I wish even just in that case there had been more things like this of so just sit and have a conversation rather than the rote, here's how you put together a verb and a whatever. And when you get out there and actually go to these countries and have to try and speak and you know interact and live your life there, it doesn't always help as well as this kind of real life experience, I think. No. Um... Yeah. It, and, and the advantage for this is you can really do it without having a background in education and ESL. This is really right. just about sitting down and chatting and mm -hmm. having a good time and uh, getting to communicate. Yeah. And the community building, that's a big thing that libraries are more trying are into a lot more is being part of the community, not just come here, check out a book, check out a movie. It's uh, you know, a community center and a place for people to um, meet and extend, expand their group, like you said, become find new friends and yeah. I think this fits perfectly. All right, doesn't have a question. We do have a couple people saying thanks so much that they learned a lot and they want to use this in their libraries. So um, hopefully you'll have some contacts <laughs> reaching out to you to get more information or um, the handbook out there. All right, we are just a little after 11 o'clock, so it's the perfect timing too to wrap up our hour for today. So thank you very much, uh, Liza. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I'm going to pull the present your screen back to my awesome. screen here. Do, do, do. There we go. Should be coming up. There we are. All right. So um, that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, our on our main Encompass Live website here, uh, nlc.nebraska.gov forward slash Encompass Live, or you can just Google uh, Encompass Live. So far, nothing else is called that on the internet. Yay. So whenever you Google it, you'll come up with um, our website and our archives. Um, the, our, uh, the recording will be posted here on the website right beneath here. We've got our upcoming shows right underneath there is a link to archived Encompass Live sessions. Um, and here's last week's about small and rural libraries leading with TV white space. And we'll have the same kind of thing. We'll have the recording, um, the presentation slides that Liza will be sending to me. And I did grab a couple of links here, um, the Census Bureau information that you were mentioning. And um, no, the other thing. The New York Times oh, one. Times. Yep, the New York Times uh, checking out the pictures. Yep. There we go. Yeah, what's going on in this picture, right? Those will both be yes. there. Um, but we'll also, along with the presentation, the slides, we'll have a separate document of the handout that she'll be sending me as well. So you'll have a awesome. couple of different things here that you'll be able to access. So that will wrap it up for today's show. I'll hope you join us next week when our topic is making space administrative weeding. Uh, Scott Childers is um, our Southeast Library System Director on the Southeast corner here of Nebraska. And he has a session about for libraries, you, know, you always weed your books um, and your materials in the library for the patrons and users. What about the library director? As a director and the administrator, what do you need to weed out of your files? Uh, how long do you need to keep things for? Are there state rules, county rules, whatever? Um, or just what's a good idea to keep or what is okay to get rid of? And so Scott will be giving us a session next week on that. So please do sign up for that or any of our other upcoming shows we have here. I've got all the April dates 
um, up here on the page. Um, May will be coming up soon. I've got all those days booked too. I've just got to get the descriptions up so you'll see them coming up as well. Um, and Compass Live is also on Facebook. We have a Facebook link here and any of our sessions. Here's our Facebook page over here. Uh, I post updates about when a new show is coming up, when recordings are available. Uh, here was a reminder from this morning to log in on the fly today's show if you wanted to. So if you are a big user of Facebook, please do uh, pop over there and give us a like uh, on that side. Other than that, that does wrap it up for this morning. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Liza. Thank and you, we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.